hundred thousand. <laughs> hundred. Amen. Isn't that incredible? That's just God is good. All right, y'all. The book of Romans, chapter number five, and verse number nineteen, and the easy to read version. It really is good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Make sure you bring someone to church with you next week. The book of Romans, chapter number five, verse number nineteen, and the easy to read version. The Bible says this. One man disobeyed God, and many became sinners. But in the same way, one man obeyed God, and many will be made right. Many will be made right. One man obeyed God, and many... What are you doing to that child? Who is choking that baby like that? <laughs> I don't want to call the CPS and get you arrested for what you are doing to that baby. That baby's like, stop doing this to me. Romans chapter 5, the last line, it says, One man obeyed God and many will be made right. Will be made right. I want to share with you a word entitled, The Impact of One. The Impact of One. Now, this is an interesting dynamic because I do want to dig somewhat into your history. But I don't want you to be traumatized or to have a triggering moment. Here is the truth. Many of you were born born into a result. You were born into a consequence. You were born into some behavioral pattern or activity that was immoral, illegal, it was inappropriate, and it had nothing to do with you. Here's what I mean. Some of you were born into a family where alcohol was a consuming force. It wasn't casual. It wasn't something that you did to have fun on the weekends. But within your bloodline, Alcohol was a consuming force. Those who partook in it, they would lose their minds, they would lose their health. It was an addiction that controlled them. And because you were raised in that environment, even though you did not initially participate, the environment shaped you. And it became normal to you to drink at 6 a.m. But it had nothing to do with your desire to do it as much as it was you were born into a condition or a result. There are some of you that are in this room that are very pessimistic and negative. And it isn't because you desire to be a person that lacks faith or optimism. It's because the environment you were raised in, there was a lot of low frequency speaking. There was a lot of devalued vocabulary. There were those who would say things to you that would demean you and belittle you. And when you wanted to have a dream, they would shoot your dreams down with your words. And because you were conditioned by that environment, even though you did not desire to regurgitate what you had digested, it was just so engrafted into your molecules and DNA, you ultimately ended up doing it. So the environment itself trained you and it taught you. You were born into a condition. There are some of you that are in this room that unfortunately, and again, we're not triggering, we're considering because we want to be delivered. There are things you struggle with and you don't even know why. You don't know where they come from. You don't know where your mindset comes from. You don't understand the dynamics. But it has nothing to do with you. It was something that happened before you got here. Or when you were little, there was something that was put on you. And it has deeply impacted you. Here's the problem. If that cycle continues, it becomes generational. And then we define it as a generational curse. Now, when you say the word curse, most people immediately become spooky and think about witchcraft and voodoo. But a curse simply means there is something that is disruptive in the normal functionality of progression. It means that there is something that's hindering us from being better. There's something that's hindering us from overcoming. There's something that is oppressing and suppressing us. There is some dynamic that's keeping our family from being who God has called us to be. And it may be the result, perhaps, of something that was spiritual, some divination, but it could just possibly be the participations and practices that we have been involved in for years that have created a cycle that is ongoing because nobody thought that they had the ability to stop it. And so we accept things that we don't have to accept because we don't have the knowledge that just because you were born in it doesn't mean you have to stay in it. And just because it happened to you doesn't mean that it has a right to dictate uh, your progression in life. I want to say this to you. A lot of the stuff that you deal with, please hear my heart because I say it from love, is not your fault. It's 
not your fault. There are some things that, of course, we have participated in that we should take direct blame for. But there are some insecurities, there are some struggles, there are some areas of insufficiency and uncertainty and a lack of clarity that is not our fault. Something happened to us or even down to our health. There are some of you in this room, your health is where it is because you were raised in an environment with a poor dietary plan. We were so focused on flavor, we weren't fo focused on blood pressure. We we're so focused, watch this, on maintaining our health as opposed to opposing our unhealthy state. This is what I mean. Instead of realizing that we could get rid of our type 2 diabetes if we changed our diet, we just decided to up our insulin. Because we didn't want to change the habit, we just wanted to pacify so we could continue, oh my God, continue going forward without the challenge of, if I really want to be healed, then I'm going to have to give something up. Watch this, I don't like the idea, I hate to say this to you, of separating myself from some of the people I love. But if the people I love are hindering me from doing what the God I love wants me to do, then this is an unfortunate, necessary dismissal. It's an unfortunate, necessary separation. I still love you, but I gotta love you from over here because you wanna stay in our generational condition, but I wanna change my entire generation. And if that's gonna happen, then somebody has to say, I'm the one. But when you discuss that, and you say you're the one, most of you immediately say, what could I possibly do to impact an entire generation? Please understand, wherever there is a curse, there is a root of that curse. Wherever there is a root of that curse, there is someone that planted that seed, which means that the curse started with one person. And if one person can do something so vile, so wicked, and so evil that it now sprouts and goes from generation to generation, that means that one person has the power to stop that curse and eliminate it so it doesn't impact another, ah, uh, come here, another generation. What happens is, YPJ teach this thing, when you refuse to acknowledge that there is a dysfunction, you make excuses to normalize the chaos in your life. You refuse to acknowledge this is dysfunctional. The way I think, this is not, it is not functional for me to desire isolation. I'm using an excuse to pacify this behavior because I'm afraid of being hurt. It is dysfunctional for me to need to have alcohol in a full bottle that is brown at 6 a.m. to calm my nerves when it's not only quote unquote calming my nerves, it's numbing your endorphins and it's killing your liver. But I'm not concerned about my liver, I'm concerned about my emotions. And this pacifies, but baby, can I talk to you right now? That after you sober up, the problems are still there. And you're gonna have to get another drink and another drink. Jesus looked at the woman and said, baby, if you drink from this well, you will never thirst again. I will give you something that will be so sufficient, you won't have to deal with the depression that you try to drink away with the brown liquor. Do I have anybody in here that knows you don't need brown liquor when you trust in the brown man that went to the cross and died for your sins and shed his red blood. Can we take a praise break that generational curses are breaking today? That something's gonna stop in your bloodline today? I gotta teach, but just give God a... All right, I apologize, take the seat. The Bible says in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 11, and verse number 11 in the New Living Translation, so now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you're still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. Solomon, who was the wisest king and the richest king ever, a completely handsome a completely charming, intelligent man who could articulate thought with great clarity had taken Israel and brought them into a powerful nation. But the Lord said to Solomon, as long as you keep my decrees and do what I've called you to do, you will always be successful. But how many of you know it's easy to be humble when you ain't got nothing? Y'all quiet in this place. Lord, if you just bless me, I'll bless you back. Until you get that car. Until you get the job, all of a sudden your attitude is different. The Bible says that Solomon began to interact and intertwine not with women. The Bible says he loved strange women. 
The difference between a woman and a strange woman was in that biblical time, they were told you were only to involve yourself with people who have the same similar belief. They serve Jehovah God. But Solomon, because of his interactions with various kingdoms and his wisdom and ability to avoid war, would begin to interact with kings and make covenants and agreements and treaties based on marriage. He would say, I'll marry your daughter here, I'll marry your daughter here as long as we have peace. And he would bring different queens in from different nations as his wives. Watch this. So many so that he surpasses the thousands with wives and concubines, many of which he did not visit sexually. He would put them in what's called a harem because once the king married the woman, they belonged to him. They were property. So these women were put in these rooms with an overseer where now Solomon may have visited them one time for his own sexual gratification, opened them up sexually, and never visited them again. So now you have a room full of women that are sexually turned on with no man to suffice them. Who do you think, I wish I could teach this thing in now brought about that spirit that would have them desire each other. It was a man who played with their emotions. I think sometimes we blame the world for the condition of the world, when possibly it could be the people of God who are out of order. Solomon was going wild. And then what happened was now, Wally, watch this. He starts involving with women that worship pagan gods. And so they said to him, Solomon, I want you to worship my God. He says, not only worship the God of Israel, but if you sleep with somebody long enough, I guess I ain't never had nobody good like that. If you sleep, I ain't been saved my whole life. If you <laughs> Come on, some of y'all been uh, saved, unsaved a hundred times. I can always tell when you're dating somebody. His nose is wide open. What did she do to you? What did he do to you? This is a grown-up church. Solomon submits. And he begins to offer, watch this, sacrifices to pagan gods. And the Bible says, Bishop, am I right? The detestable god, Molech. This was one who believed in baby sacrifices. They would do demonic things. And watch this, Solomon began to worship these pagan idols that were endorsed by demonic spirits and principalities. So he started worshiping demons. And the Bible says that God became irate with his behavior. And he said, because of what you have done, I am going to tear the kingdom away from you. But listen to the good part. He said, but I'm not going to do it while you're alive because of your father, David. Which means the only reason why nothing's going to happen to you now is because your daddy had a relationship with me. I got to stop for a minute. Do you know that some of y'all need to tell your mama, your daddy, your grandparents, thank you, your uncle, your auntie, why? Because they were praying for you when you wasn't praying for yourself. And there were times the devil was going to take you out of here, but because God heard their... But the Bible says, he says, I am, this is the messed up part, I will take the kingdom away from your son. Solomon's son was not present. He was not there. There was a conversation being had about Solomon's son that he had nothing to do with, which meant his father's sin was deeply impacting his future. His father's obsession with gratification was impacting his son's future. And his son, this is why y'all got to catch this. Be careful what your kids see you do. I know it doesn't mean anything to you now because you got to get yours off and you got to get high and you got to get drunk and you got to do what you do to satisfy you. But what you don't realize is what might be something minor for you could be something major for them. If you don't allow yourself to see, they're watching me. These hand claps getting real quiet in here. I think somebody's offended. Yada ba ba da ba. I got good news for you. The book of Exodus chapter number 20. Verse number four, Solomon had hindered his son based on his activity. This is what the Bible says. You must not make up for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them and worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other cars, any other houses, any other people, any other God. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love, but I lavish unfailing love for, the, for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this seems very unfair. 
So, so I'm clear. I got to go through because of what my daddy did. I got to go through because of what my mother did. If you don't understand the context of this verse, you will think that God is saying that the children have to suffer for what the parents did. And you will think that they are bound to a sin that they really didn't have anything to do with. No. What he's teaching is the consequence of one generation's actions and how it impacts the others. Because when you read down further, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 24 and verse number 16, parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. So this is under the law. We're not under the law anymore, but this was under the law where God was showing himself to be just. He says, even though there is an impact from the prior generation, I still don't hold it against the children. They just have to carry the burden of what you put on them. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18 and verse number 19 in the New Living Translation, he says, what? You ask, doesn't a child pay for the parent's sin? The answer is no. For if the child does, does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. Verse 20 says, the person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for their parent's sins and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. All this is is explaining the nature of God and that he really isn't saying that because what somebody else did, you have to suffer. He was trying to show them generational impact, that your decisions have a ripple effect, that what you think is no big deal can impact somebody in a great, great way. I would like to have a transparent moment with you. I know for sure there are things that I have done as a man that had God not covered me, they could have had some major impacts on those that were around me. Because even when I don't want to be watched, there are people that are watching me. And that is a challenging thing because, watch this, the devil knows that he cannot touch you. You've been doing this nonsense forever and God's grace has kept you. But don't you know he wants to impact your children? So he wants to keep you in dysfunctional relationships so he can keep your son in dysfunctional relationships. He wants you to abandon your responsibility to pay child support and be the man you're supposed to be because now your son can justify it with the excuse, my daddy wasn't there and he didn't do for me. And these excuses allow us, remember, to normalize our dysfunction. It's a little quiet in here, but I think you guys are listening to me. If you've been divorced eight times and you're on the ninth marriage, but you haven't figured out why you were divorced eight times, you are doing your family a disservice and we are not coming to the wedding because we're tired of getting suits for you and your many weddings. This is a real thing. Pastor, you've been single for 14 years. Why haven't you gotten remarried? Because it takes time for you to realize the dysfunction within yourself. You thought I was gonna say something about the other person, right? No, you gotta look at you and say, wait a minute, I gotta work on my communication. I have to work on my literacy. I have to work on my disciplines. I have to work on my ability to listen without interrupting. Oh, I'm trying to help some married couples today. I have to make sure that I take on the responsibility of a man to ensure that all things are stable. I have to make sure that my relationship with God is solid and sound. But most people are not doing that because we're lonely. And because we're lonely, we keep allowing the same type of person to continue the generational curse. All right, y'all want me to stop? Not just yet. So we understand now that God is not going to punish the generation simply because of what somebody else did. It's talking about generational impact. That's the cue. But here's the part where it changes. We acknowledge that there is generational impact based on our behaviors that can impact to the degree that we acknowledge it to be a curse. Where y'all mess up is, you think that the curse cannot be broken without some mystical magic. You think that this has to, we have a generational curse of poverty, so we have to stay in poverty. No, you don't. We have a generational curse of sickness and disease that runs rampant. Cancer just runs in our family. I'll probably get it. Let me stop you there with that negative confession. What you have to say is, it runs in our family, but with me, it's gonna run out of our family. You have to have a different confession. So, where's the good news, YPJ? The book of Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 13 in the New Living Translation. I try to give y'all a Bible so that it doesn't sound like eisegetical rhetoric when I'm up here just rambling off. The Bible says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who was hung on a tree. 
Through Christ Jesus, God has not cursed us. He has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham's so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Now look at Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 22. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. YPJ, how do I break the curse? It is simple. All you have to do is believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You have to believe that Jesus died for you, that he was buried in the ground, that on the third day he got up, he ascended into heaven, and now he is seated on a throne. When you believe in this act that was done in sacrificial form for the redemption of your sin, you now have a right to speak to any curse and tell it you have no power over me. I got to talk to y'all because a lot of you will talk to yourself about how much you owe on a bill. You'll talk to yourself about how frustrated you are in life, but you won't talk to yourself when the enemy gives you a negative thought. You have got to fight and combat those negative thoughts with confessions of faith. When the enemy says your entire family has always been broke, y'all ain't never going to have no money. You say, no, I am the first millionaire in my family, but I will not be the last because that generational curse is broken based on my faith in Jesus Christ. Uh -uh, I know everybody gets sick around 50 and the men in my family die of heart attacks at 60. I dare you as a man, as a woman to declare, I'm going to live to be so old, they're going to be wishing I was dead. And say, when is A.T. going to die? She's 108. But it's because I pled the blood over my life and my bloodline, and I declared the curse is over. Can you be the captain on your row and tell them, because of Jesus, the curse is over. Come on, tell them that. Because of Jesus, the curse. And if you believe it, that's a good place to shout. Because as of today, you have a right to speak over your entire family, even the ones that don't like you, and say, I'm going to be the difference maker. Something's got to happen. One person's impact. Sorry for yelling at y'all. I get excited. The book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 19 is where we started. And in the book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 19, this part blesses me. It says, one man disobeyed God and many became sinners. We know that that was Adam. Adam sinned in the garden, and because of his behavior, sin was released. So it impacts all of us. We all sin. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time, and this church is going to act like y'all got some biblical sense and respond. We all sin. Thank you. Because if you're in this building and you say you have not sinned, the Bible calls you a liar. Now, you may have a sin that we don't see. And my sin may be more obvious than yours. But everybody got something that they deal with on a continual basis, which is why you need a savior. So, because of this force of sin, we all suffer to some degree. Sickness is the result of sin. Death is the result of sin. Murder is the result of sin. Untimely death, the result of sin. An individual says to me, I don't believe in God. Why don't you believe in God? Because if God was real, there's too much suffering in the world. There's no way that God would allow babies to die if he was real. My question to them was, you don't believe in God. I do not. Suffering still exists. Who's responsible for it? Who's responsible for it? Well, humans are responsible for it. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Why can't both exist? God is real and suffering exists, but the suffering is still the human's fault. Watch this. They say, okay, but if God was real, why doesn't he stop the suffering? Because no matter how much God tries to stop the suffering, humans keep creating it. I got to help y'all. A guy violates a child. The first thing we all say is he deserves death. So we say kill that guy for violating the child. God comes and kills the guy. The parents of the violated child say God is good. The mother of the violator says, why did you kill my son? Because even though he is a violator, that was still her son. And she hated his behavior, but she loved her son. So now she's mad at God, even though they're happy, which means that nobody is always going to, okay. Somebody going to be mad at God no matter what God does. So God is saying, how y'all blaming me for the human condition? This is the result of human beings not doing what they're supposed to do. Hallelujah. So this sin issue now is the result of Adam who introduced it. But the Bible is powerful in that it says even though Adam introduced it, but in the same way, one man obeyed God and many will be made right. This is important. It says many became sinners because of one person's behavior. 
But on the other hand, it says many will be made right because of another person's behavior, which means one person started it and one person stopped it. One person started it and another person stopped it. Because one person who started it, they did they dirt and died. They just left a mess for everybody to clean up. And most were intimidated and would not make a difference. Let's close here. The Bible says, and you've heard this story, that there was a giant by the name of Goliath. And one day, I am going to teach you all about the Nephilim. I'm going to teach you about the Anunnaki, because a lot of y'all think all this stuff is uh, um, fantasy. But some of it has biblical truths where demons and principalities have presented themselves to the world in form and fashion where they were given the secrets of heaven to men that they were not supposed to do. This is why when Jesus shows up, the demons start talking to him, and they say, have you come to destroy us? Because they knew they were going to be destroyed. So Jesus now has the demons upset and in an uproar, but one area of demonic activity was amongst those who were giants because the giants were the results of the sons of God. These are principalities or ruling spirits that came down from the heavenly host and they had intercourse with human women. It's in your Bible. And it says they produced heroes of that time, men of old, who had divine DNA mixed with human DNA, and it caused these mutated figures. They were calling them heroes. They had super strength, super speed. You call them X-Men. It's in the Bible. And so because of it, these men started mutating, and they were growing to 15, 16, 20 feet, 22 feet, and they began to ravish the world. Evil was being performed on every side. And the Bible says because of it, God was going to wipe them out with a flood because they were all filled with blood that should not exist. He was not being mean when he says crush the baby's heads against the stone. It was because they were demonically influenced children that could never be converted. So when you realize what was happening in the Old Testament, he knew the war that was coming. So God says we got to wipe all of these babies out. We got to wipe all these giants out. But regardless of what they attempted to do, this thing went on and giants still existed. There was a giant who was considered a small giant who was almost 10 feet tall. His name was Goliath. I said he was considered a small giant. His brothers were bigger than him. And he was intimidating and mocking the children of Israel. Behind Goliath was a group of individuals called the Philistines. They were warriors in their tribe and they were all dark people. I love throwing that in there. I love it because I want y'all to know what color the Bible really was. They were ready to fight against another group of dark people called the Israelites. And so when they got to war, Goliath knew that there was a ritual they had where one champion would go against another champion. And if the one champion defeated the other champion, they didn't have to go to war. The other army had to submit to the army of the winning champion. So Goliath, being nine foot skilled in war with a large spear that was so heavy it took a couple people to carry it and a sword that barely he could lift himself, he goes to war and he says, bring me one man, I'll fight that man. All of Israel's terrified. They refuse to fight him. A little boy who they called David who was described as dark and ruddy comes out of a sheepfold at about 15, 16 years old with a slingshot. He says, why is this giant able to talk down and discredit our people? Won't anybody fight him? And they all said, he's a man of war since his youth. We're not going to do it. David goes to the king at a 15, 16-year-old age and says, even though my brothers who are older than me and more skilled in war will not fight this giant, I will fight the giant. The king immediately discredits him because of his youth and his size. Listen to me. When you decide you're going to be the one that makes a difference, be careful who you talk to. Because there are those who are going to try to discourage you and tell you that it's not possible. Look at your neighbor and tell him it is possible. It is. So now uh, David says to the king, no, I can fight this dude. He says, no, that dude been fighting since he was young. Wait a minute. You're crediting him for being a good warrior since he was young. But now you're telling me that because I'm young, I can't fight. That's a double standard, sir. He says, okay, go to war. He says, here, take my armor. David says, I can't take your armor because it doesn't fit. Listen to me, king. If you didn't want to fight the generational curse with your armor, why would you try to give me something that didn't even work for you? How you giving me advice about a relationship and you ain't had a successful one yet? How are you telling me how to raise my kids and your kids hate your guts? I got to help somebody today. All right, I'm sorry. The Bible says that David says, I have a slingshot. It's all I need. You know what the thought process is? A slingshot was the one y'all see with Dennis the Menace where he takes it, he pulls it back, and that's not what it was. There is a passage of scripture where the Bible says they sent to war a group of people that all they were armed with was slingshots because they knew how to maneuver them so fast with leather straps that the rocks would fly out at the speed of bullets. The slingshots were like 
guns. And those who understood how to use a slingshot were like gun slingers. I got to change the way you see David. David didn't step up to that man with a little slingshot that he pulled back. David stepped up and said, what's that? What's that noise? Is that it? Wow, mm, wow. The tumbleweed went through. And David said, howdy, partner. Goliath's nine feet tall. He looks and says, who is this boy that you have sent to me? He said, this is mockery. Got to talk to y'all. Cancer is bigger than you. Depression is bigger than you. Anxiety is bigger than you. These things are bigger and they are stronger than you. He said, how dare you approach me? David said, let me help you. You come to me with your power, your sword, your spear. He said, but the difference is I'm not coming representing myself. I come to you in the name of the Lord. You ain't fighting me, buddy. You fighting all of heaven's army. The Bible said David got his slingshot and took off running at the giant. I wonder if I had anybody in here that would say, I'm done with this curse. I'm taking off running at it today. The Bible says he swung that thing around and threw that rock. That rock hit Goliath, smack dab in the middle of the forehead, and Goliath fell. Here's where we mess up. We stop when he falls. And we say, he fell to the ground. He won the victory. No, David said, I'm going to cut your head off. The problem is David threatened and told Goliath, I will cut your head off, but he didn't have a sword. How do you make a threat and you don't have the necessary equipment to fulfill what you said? Because what you are saying is God will provide what is necessary for me to take care of what's been plaguing my family. I don't got the education, but he's going to provide the education. I ain't got the money, but he's going to provide the money. The Bible says when he knocked Goliath down, he looked at Goliath's sword and said, well, looky here. I'm going to kill you with what you had designed to kill me. Today is a day of reversal, baby. Today is a day where we call the referee over and say, I need you to look at this on the monitor because I'm going to reverse this thing today. The very thing that was meant to destroy me, I wish I had a praiser. I'm going to use that thing against the enemy. And the Bible says David cut Goliath's head off. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the opportunity to be the one that has an impact on an entire generation. If we would just say, I believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as of right now, I'm not walking in any more generational curses. I'm not going to be suicidal. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be overweight and weighed down. I will walk in peace, freedom, and love. Do I have six people in here that will leap, yell, shout, jump, do something to let the Lord know you believe that he's able to change the situation through you? I declare that generational poverty stops with you. I declare that generational sickness stops with you. I declare that generational emotional frustration stops with you. Can I get a praiser that will agree with me right now? Amen. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I've rambled long enough. One person can have impact. One person can have impact. And that person is you. One person can have impact. You looking to the left or the right. No, 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 no. That person is you. How many of you have a cell phone? You have a cell phone. Would you take it out real fast, please? Would you just grab your cell phone really quick? If you got one, if you don't, don't worry about it. Turn your camera on. Turn your camera on as quick as you can, and then turn the cameras around to see your face. Turn the camera around to see your face. Nobody else, just your face. Now, look, this ain't the time, Nene, for y'all to be trying to get the perfect angle. I want you, when I count to three, to take a selfie and do not delete it. You ready? Y'all ready? Get your phone out. Some of the older people, it takes them a little longer. They, they, they. Now, how you flip this thing, baby? I was at the airport, and this lady's like, oh, why don't you take it? I'll take a picture. I was like, yeah, yeah. She's sitting there. Now, how you? Give me the phone, lady. Here. Y'all ready? When I count to three, you're going to take a picture, and I'll explain right. Here we go. One, two, take it. Three. Keep that photo. That photo is going to be the reminder for you every day that there is one person in my family that will have generational impact and the person is the person in this photo. Now, most of you have phones where the photo is dated. You may come back 10 years from now and look and say, wow, I really